<laughs> Good morning, everyone. <laughs> I'll ask you now to please rise if you are able and join me in this call to worship on this Easter Sunday. Praise the Lord. How good is it to sing praises to our God? Because God is gracious and a song of praise is fitting. God gathers the outcasts. The Lord heals the brokenhearted. He determines the number of stars. He gives to them all their names. Great is our Lord and abundant in the power to save, to restore and reconcile to sing to the Lord with thanksgiving, make melody to our God. His delight is not in strength, but the Lord takes pleasure in those who hope in his steadfast love. Opening hymn is 232, Jesus Christ is risen today.
Please be seated. The joy of this Easter Sunday reminds and reassures us of God's resurrecting power. So let us be bold enough to admit all that turns us toward death so that we can know the grace of new and abundant life in Jesus Christ. Would you join me in our unison prayer of confession and preparation for worship this morning? Savior God, forgive our life-alienating ways, our exclusion and judgment of others, the way we evaluate and compare. Forgive our death-dealing sins, our habits that demean and degrade, our addiction to violent and destructive behavior. Forgive our clinging to old hurts and our investment in empty promises. Redeem us, restore us, resurrect us for life in Christ. And we continue now with our silent prayer. The truth of our lives we offer in gratitude this morning and in the name of Jesus who teaches us when we gather together to pray always saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now remaining seated and in the spirit of prayer, please join me in singing hymn 243, Be Not Afraid. Be not afraid. That is the message. Every time the divine and the human interact in the scriptural tradition, the first words, the first message from God is, don't be afraid. You're not alone. Like the prodigal son who had decided finally to turn back to his father and to admit all that he'd done wrong, had this big speech planned. The father never let him even open his mouth. He simply embraced him and said, welcome home. Wherever you've been, whatever you've done, or left undone. It doesn't matter in God's heart. You are beloved. You are cherished. And the resurrection shows that that promise, that that love will always be yours, proves and celebrates the good news that our God is committed to never, never leaving us alone. So trust and believe that good news on this Easter morning. In Christ Jesus, you are loved, you are precious, and you are embraced and welcomed just as you are today, and you are forgiven. Amen. If you're able, let's stand and give God back that gift of love.
Amen. Thank you, Max. Please be seated. It's always so good to be surrounded by a bunch of horns. I do it every year. Never gets old. To me, anyway. Welcome to the Presbyterian Church of Upper Montclair on this Easter Sunday morning, our first of two services. You're welcome to join us for the second one. Uh, we have two services today to celebrate this incredible truth that through the hardest part of life, the worst we can imagine, life, love, hope, they all persist. It is good news. So it's good to be here with you today. If you are a visitor here at PCUM, you're especially welcome and precious. We can't do this without you. Together, by the power of the Spirit, we are the family and the people of God. With all of our backgrounds and perspectives and different points of view and gifts to bring, it is an amazing thing to be together online and in person. So welcome all of you who are here today online as well. We are gathered by probably another hundred at least folks who are worshiping virtually uh, with the folks who are here in this beautiful sanctuary today. If you are sitting near the center aisle, would you grab that black booklet? You, right, those of you near the aisle in your pew, if you'd grab that black ritual of friendship pad and fill it out completely, if you would, especially today, because those of us who know how to fill that out can model that for folks who might be new, and then pass it to the sides, and then during the course of the service, if you'd pass it back to its starting place. Take a look. Uh, at all of the detail and information here this morning. We have wonderful dedications to loved ones, to honor and remember loved ones uh, purchasing flowers today. I don't know, can you smell them out there? I think uh, they are uh, beautiful and powerful in all kinds of ways. Very fragrant, we're we're hearing, yeah. Uh, But we're all professionals up here, so we're going to fight our way through the incredibly beautiful odor. (laughs) <laughs> up here. And they, they are gorgeous flowers today. Um, and all of you look great as well. Take a look and to see all the, the things that are in the bulletin this morning by way of invitation to you to participate in the life and ministry of this community of faith every day of the year. We have a couple of core commitments in this church. We serve and care for those in need here in Montclair, in neighboring Newark, and in New York City. Uh, homeless, hungry folks, folks who are Uh, living on the margins. It's a commitment here in this congregation. Our children and our young people are also central to the life of this church. Uh, There are lots of ways to get involved in supporting them and teaching them and being loved and taught by them. And it's an amazing thing. A lot of incredible volunteer opportunities for that as well. And then, of course, as you'll have already experienced and will experience this morning, our music program is the heartbeat of the life of this church. Uh, And not just those of us up here on the steps, though I can't really say I contribute to the music program very much. I lip sync when my mic might be on, for your sake. Uh, But the music is really so meaningful at all ages and at all levels here in the church, and it is an important part of what we do. It really drives everything. There are lots of ways to be part of that program as well. Take a look at the date in a box in in your announcements this morning. Of April 21st, PCUM's Got Talent. It's a wonderful, cherished annual tradition here. You know, this is the Montclair area, the northern New Jersey, New York City area. There are there is talent galore, especially in this congregation. Again, you're gonna be experiencing that this morning. If you come on April 21st, you'll experience even more of that, all kinds of singing and acting and amazing ways of sharing uh, gifts that are given by God with the rest of us. Mark your calendar, plan to be here for that. You can meet people. It's a lot really enjoyable, and it's a way of augmenting and supporting our music program here so that we can continue to bring in amazing uh, quintets and soloists and other musical, uh, uh, musically talented folks for the life of this church. So April 21st, and of course all kinds of other things happening here as well. Uh, Welcome this morning. It's so good to be here. There is a time of fellowship right after this service, between the services, the 9 a.m. and 11 a.m., right across the way in Fellowship Hall. You are warmly invited to be a part of that time of refreshment and conversation. Welcome.
Hey there. All right. Thank you, Sierra. I told you PCUM's got talent. <laughs> Would the children please come join me up here at the front? Hey, guys. Grab some carpet. Good morning. Good 
morning. Let's try it again. Let's try it again. Let's try it again. Good morning. Good morning. Thank, thank you very much. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. All right. You want the bad news or the good news? Good news. I'm going to start with the bad news. All right. When I was growing up, I'd wake up in the morning and there would be a basket waiting for me on Easter Sunday. We called it a Easter an Easter basket, right? And it was always filled with amazing things. Eggs, which I do like, chocolate. A little bit later when I got older, deodorant. And I, and I got right? Yeah, How many of you know what an Easter basket is? Oh, okay. In fact, I saw two Easter baskets this morning in front of my children's rooms, but look what I got. An Easter basket with nothing in it. It's empty. I expected it to be full, and I got there, and it was empty. Well, there, is a cu- there are a couple things. There's a couple of measly pieces of fake grass. Don't even know... I think it has a half-life of 75 billion years. And some pieces of paper. How do you think I felt? Sad. Sad, exactly. Easter baskets, when they're full, make me feel loved. When I was a kid, it made me feel like my mommy and my daddy still loved me. And that they were reminding me that God loved me. And this morning, what do I get? Nothing. Almost nothing. Nothing. But as I tell my kids, I didn't have much growing up. I had to make do with what I had. So let's just see what we got here. And we got some, like I said, we got the fake grass. Oh, and I've got some paper. You know what? I'm a storyteller, right? I think I can probably make something out of this. No. Yes. <laughs> let's see what I got here. Oh, wait a minute. What's this? A That's a heart. Dun, dun, dun. It reminds me of this guy who came into the world and told people they should love each other as much as they love themselves. And to love God with all their strength, all their mind, and all their heart. His name was Jesus. What was his last name? Think about it. Good. Always a good answer. Not exactly right. What, sweetie? Christ? Yeah, nope. The last name wasn't Christ, and his middle initial was an H. (laughs) His last name was of Nazareth. We call him Christ, and that became his name, you're right, because it means Savior. He taught us how to love, but not everybody liked it, because when when you're all of a sudden you have to love other people as much as you love yourself, what does that mean? It means it's hard, right, because I love myself, right? It means you have to change. People don't like change. So they got so mad at this guy, what did they do to him? They killed him. Yep, they killed him. We know that's true, too. It's in history. He was executed. There you go. Well, let's go home. Nice. But this is how we found that out. Early in the morning, on Easter morning, When he was dead, three women, according to Mark's gospel, came to the tomb to find him. And just like my Easter basket, they found it empty. And they were so sad. They were sad that he died, and they said that he wasn't there. And their hearts were broken. This took a long time this morning. They kind of, I cut it. It looks like I did, but this is a broken heart. This is how sad they were. But then they went inside the tomb, and they saw a young guy dressed all in white. Cora? Is the answer going to be God? Probably. Just hang in there. Hours and hours, yeah. Because I, yeah. And the three women were so sad, their hearts were broken. They, they supported each other, but then they walked in and they saw a young man in white, and he said, he's not here, he is risen. Go, do what you're supposed to do, live your life, love other people, 
as much as you love yourself, and you're going to meet him. Don't worry, you will. And all of a sudden, their hearts came back together. See? Oh, I, you're right. I could have just put them back together. Yeah. I'll use these notes for the 11 o'clock. Okay. <laughs> and because he lives, we know that we are loved always. We're never alone. Right? The same God, there you go, who gave us life in the first place when we were born, is always going to be with us. No matter what we go through, no matter what happens, I cut it. I admit it. All right? You got me. You guys ready for a repeat after me prayer? Let's say it loud and proud so the Methodists can hear us. All right? You ready? Dear God. Dear God. Thank you for Easter. Thank you for Easter. And for Easter baskets. Even if they're empty. Thank you for an empty tomb. Because it means he lives. And he loves us. And you love us. And we love you too. Amen. Thank you, kids. There's something waiting for you outside, I think. And now, a reading from Psalm 18. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. The Lord is my strength and my might. He has become my salvation. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has punished me severely, but he did not give me over to death. Open me to the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. The stone that builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. The word of the Lord. And our second reading this morning is Mark's version of the Easter story, the 16th chapter beginning with the first verse. Listen to what the Spirit is saying to you and to the church today. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. The word of the Lord. Please pray with me. Oh God, on this Easter Sunday morning, this Resurrection Sunday, with so much 
that is of death happening all around us, all around this world in many of our lives, so much destructiveness and hurt. We pray that the meditations of our hearts together upon this, your word to us this Easter Sunday morning might both be acceptable in your sight and life-giving to us, abundant life-giving. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I think I surprise the future ministers in my classes in seminary when I tell them probably the most important sermon that they can preach on any given Sunday is how they react when something goes wrong when it doesn't go as planned. This may shock you sometime. I know I look like I have it all together. But there are times when Anne-Marie is supposed to be playing that I start talking. And there are times when I'm supposed to be talking that Anne-Marie starts playing. It happens. Children on Sunday rarely do what they rehearsed on Saturday. Cell phones go off. I'll give you a moment to check yours now. The truth of Easter is this. No matter how much you prepare, if, like life, you expect worship to be problem-free, you're going to be disappointed, and you're going to look disappointed and maybe even annoyed. And when you're in my line of work, you don't want to look annoyed or disappointed when you're up here. Even worse, if you're expecting things to go perfectly in life or in worship, when when they don't, you sometimes are frozen. You don't know what to do. You don't know how to go forward. I once baptized this beautiful baby girl in my congregation in Denver, and the pastor before me had been beloved. She was amazing. And since she had in a previous life, before she became Presbyterian and saw the light, she'd been an Episcopalian, she had introduced the practice of using oil along with water in baptisms. And we're, that's okay, we can do that. We need the water, the oil is optional. So I thought, why not? I'll just carry forward this cherished tradition. But apparently, I use a lot more water than Episcopalians do. And as I was holding this little baby girl, and I father-sonned and Holy spirited her, Um, the oil that I then put on her forehead in the form of a cross, which was this pungent clove oil, got mixed in with the water. And just as I was holding her and then praying this very holy, loving prayer about how I wanted this child to know how much I and her church would always love her, that mixture of water and pungent clove oil went right into her eyes. And she let out a scream that the exorcist would have envied. (laughs) And her mother grabbed her from my arms and sprinted out of the sanctuary. And I rarely don't know what to say or do. And I didn't know what to say or I didn't know what to do. And it was the longest 45 seconds of my life. I didn't know she was going to jump in her car and just keep on going. These people blinded my child. But she came back to mom had found a water fountain and washed her daughter's eyes out with what you're supposed to use in baptism, water, just water. And I've never used oil since. Thankfully, she came back. The Reverend Jim Paxson writes about the first worship service he ever led in a tiny country church down south. Uh, He wanted to impress people, so he gave it his all that first sermon, always a mistake. We all would do it. Uh, But when he got done finally preaching, he thought to himself, well, that wasn't too bad. But just as he thought that, a woman jumped up from her pew and started to scream. His first thought was, I'm in a charismatic church. No. His second thought was, was the sermon that bad? But then the woman finally got a hold of herself and was able to put out words. She screamed, my mother is dead. And now Pastor Jim thought, I killed someone with my first sermon. Not a good start. Everybody panicked. The daughter was still screaming. The ushers all ran out to call an ambulance. Everybody was yelling advice. But then in the middle of all that panic and hoo-ha, 
A soft but clear voice could be heard. It was the allegedly dead woman, obviously annoyed. She said to her, looked at her daughter and she said, hush, you're making a scene. <laughs> Sounds just like my, my mother would have said. Well, everyone quieted down, Reverend Patson says, more like, more like shocked silence. And then he thought, maybe my preaching has the power both to kill and to resurrect. <laughs> but no, it wasn't about the preacher. It usually never is. Overcome by the heat and possibly the a little longish preaching, the woman had let herself drift as many of us do, into a little snooze there in her pew, and her daughter had evidently jumped to conclusions and overreacted. Strange things, strange things do happen in churches just like they do in life, which reminds me of a Max Lucado story about a physician who mis misdiagnosed a patient, declaring the woman to be dead. The family was informed, the husband overcome with grief. So imagine the surprise of the nurse when she was checking the body and discovered that the woman indeed had a, had a slight pulse. You better tell the family, she urged the doctor, and the embarrassed physician did call the husband and said, I need to talk to you about the condition of your wife. And the husband said, the condition of my wife, she's dead. And the doctor mumbled with embarrassment, there's been a slight improvement. slight improvement. Talk about an understatement. The truth is, once a person has been declared dead, if they revive, they never were dead at all. Instead, there was either a tragic mistake or a tragic fraud. And that's the fundamental tenet of Christianity, by the way. Death is real, all too real. When a person dies, they die. Fini. Schluss. There is no getting around it. There is no skipping that part, no matter how much we'd like to try. Except one person. The exception took place at a tomb just outside of Jerusalem, and nobody can really agree on an explanation as to what happened. Nobody. According to Mark's version, as we've said, with the children, three women, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, who by the way was Jesus' brother, so you can do the math there, and another woman named Salome brought spices to anoint the body of a man who had just been executed as a criminal. They got up so early to tend to this body that it connotes an intimacy with the deceased, with this man. They knew him, these women, and they were overcome with grief, with loss, with devastation. They didn't help know how to go on. That's what grief is. Have you been there? Let's not be so familiar with the story that we forget how profoundly devastated and sad these women are as they walk to the tomb that day. If you've ever had to go through something that you have tried Everything in your power to avoid, prayer, jogging, uh, kale, whatever it is, and, it, and you couldn't help it, it still happened to you. The layoff, the firing, the financial downturn, the illness, the relationship that's been irretrievably lost and broken. Then you know that the gospel stories, contrary to popular belief, are very realistic very realistic. We cannot avoid these things. Even if we play our cards right, life always takes a sudden and unexpected turn. As they get closer to the tomb, the three women wonder who's going to roll that giant rock out of, the front, uh, out of the way in front of the tomb. And to their amazement, when they got there, the rock was gone. It had already been rolled away. They go inside. They see a young man dressed all in white, who is this guy? How did he get there? How did he get his clothes so clean? Now they're frightened. And they say, as I mentioned earlier, the classic word, he says the classic words to them that God in Scripture, all the way through the Judeo -Christ Christian witness, says the first thing don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And then you seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified, but he's not here. He is risen. Go. 
Go, keep living, go. Tell the disciples and Peter, go to Galilee where you're from, go back to your lives, keep doing what you've been doing and you're going to meet him there. In the going, in the doing, in the living. And I'd like to know this morning, what stops you from going forward? From getting off of that sort of stuck place where you are? What stops me from going forward? Fear? Fear of failure? Fear of rejection? Fear of being alone? Yep, all of those things. All of those things. Probably not fear of death, though. It's not that I'm not afraid of death. I just try not to think about it. How about you? In the society today, we don't have to think about it very much. We keep death at a distance. We sanitize our lives so we don't have to think about it or confront it until we're forced to. We keep death in nursing homes and in hospitals and in hospices. But not that long ago, in my mother's own family, in fact, it happened, Almost every family lost one child to death. 50, 60, 70 years ago and before that, it was a very common occurrence. People died at home back in those days. It was much more of a familiar reality. Uh, nowadays, as I say, we keep it at a distance. What really scares us today in our self-worshipping culture is aging. So we're busy solving that problem. But we should be careful with our Botox and our eye lifts and our hair plugs. Science is rapidly placing upon us the intolerable burden of Tithonus. Do you remember Tithonus from Greek mythology? Kind of a secondary character, but a good story. Aurora, the goddess of the dawn, fell in love with Tithonus, who was a mortal youth. In other words, like me, like you, Tithonus was going to die, like every human does. Zeus, the king of the gods, liked Aurora, and so offered Aurora any gift she might choose for her beloved mortal Tithonus. And naturally, she chose that Tithonus might live forever. Granted, Zeus says, but Aurora forgot to ask that, like her, Tithonus stay forever young. So, as Aurora lived forever staying young and beautiful, Tithonus grew older and older and older and could never die. And the gift became a curse. This same dynamic, by the way, is going on in my house. Um, my wife looks just like she did when we met 25 years ago. I am unrecognizable. We ignore it, we try to beat it, outsmart it, we run from it, but death just sort of hangs out in the back of our minds and our thoughts. That ultimate loss of control, that unspoken fear, that, and here's the thing, finds its way to the surface nonetheless, right? In our anger, in our restlessness, in our constant searching for something that fills that empty place. And that's why I think Easter is still so compelling for people. Not just the routine and the ham and the Easter baskets. Easter is not really an avoidance of the reality of death, as our critics would charge. There's a lot to criticize about the Christian church. That's, that's not one of them. No, I think it's because Easter means hope. Hope, not only for us as we deal with death, and disappointment and brokenness and challenge and hardship and loss and grief, but also as we deal with everyday living with the stresses that sort of are floating around in our hearts and minds and emotions, we can get through this life by living it fully, not by avoiding the problems and hurts and disappointments which inevitably will come like mistakes in worship services. And that's good news. That's what Easter tells us. Easter, if we let it, can inspire us and challenge us to lift our eyes from our problems, from the next problem that's in front of us, to our possibilities as human beings, as people. I love the way the writer Jerome K. I love the name Jerome K. Jerome. 
uh, once put it. Look up, Jerome K. Jerome once wrote. Don't look down. When you look down, you see so much of yourself that you can't see all the other things God has made, including the possibilities for you that are out there. For instance, he writes, one day I had a finger that ached, and I decided promptly that I had arthritis. So I went over to the public library, got a medical book, and looked up arthritis. By the time I got done reading two pages, I had arthritis in every joint in my hands and my knees. It scared me, and I turned the pages, and there was leukemia. And I read everything about leukemia, and before I had finished, I knew that I had leukemia. Then I turned the page to ulcers, and I said, so now I know what causes those pains in my stomach that I've always been, wonder been wondering about. I've got ulcers. Then I turned to pellagra, and I just knew that I had pellagra. I didn't know what it was, but I had it. The only thing I found in that medical book that I didn't have was housemaid's knee. And I wondered why I didn't have that. I went straight to the doctor who examined me, and he took a look at me, and he said there was nothing wrong. But then, as I was getting ready to leave, I said to him, doctor, I'm a hospital unto myself. I've got so many things wrong with me. I know I have. The doctor looked at me for a long time, and he said, well, now that you've mentioned it, you are in kind of a bad way. Uh, and now that you've diagnosed your case so well, all I can do is give you a prescription. You can take it right to the pharmacy and get it filled. So he wrote out the prescription, he folded it up, and I headed to the pharmacy. The pharmacist took it, looked at the prescription, frowned, made it, out, made it out like he was scratching his head, folded it back up and said, you know, I'm sorry, I don't have any of this in my pharmacy. I said, what, isn't this the biggest CVS in town? It replaced some kind of restaurant or something? Yes, he said, it is the biggest CVS in town, but the things your doctor has prescribed for you don't come in a bottle. He handed it back to me and said, you can take this prescription and read it for yourself. I opened it up and this is what it said. Walk eight miles every day. Come home, eat a steak, have a glass of wine, and stop reading things you've got no business reading. <laughs> that also counts for the internet, by the way. Stop trying to control things you can't control. And then it's more dangerous to look down at yourself than to look up. Because when you're always looking down at yourself, you start to feel sorry for yourself and start to think that if you just keep looking, you can control every little thing about your life and maybe even stave off death. I do think that's the power of Easter. This Sunday morning, every Easter morning, and every day, it lifts us and lifts our focus from our problems to our possibilities. To look up, not down. To look outward, to care for and pay attention to the needs of others, not always inward. To go forward with hope, not backwards, always looking back to a better time to go through and not around the mystery of this life, all the pain of it, all the joy of it. Because he lives, I can live. Jesus said in John chapter 10, I didn't come so they could go to heaven. I came that they might live full, abundant lives. What do I mean by that? Well, on Easter Sunday, it's appropriate to, to quote a rabbi. We're a very famous one, Rabbi Harold Kushner, who wrote When Bad Things Happen to Good People, but I like this one, this quote, even better. Kushner said, if you have been brave enough to love, and sometimes you won and sometimes you lost, if you have cared enough to try, and sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't, if you've been bold enough to dream and had some dreams that came true and a lot of broken pieces of dreams that didn't, then you, like Moses, can look back from the mountaintop and, like him, realize how full your life has been and how richly you are blessed. As Sylvester Stallone says, life isn't always sunshine and rainbows. There are thorns and thunderclouds. And Easter is God's promise to us that neither life nor death or any of the thorns and clouds and storms 
can ever conquer us. Easter is hope. Easter is affirmation of God's goodness and grace. And in fact, the message to you and to me today is the same as it was to those women that first Easter morning. morning. Go. Go forward and you'll meet him there. Why are we looking for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Please pray with me. Loving God, we give you thanks that at the end of our reservoir of vast capabilities and talents and gifts, when we run out of steam and energy and ideas, when we don't know what to do or how to go forward, you are there with us, opening doors we may not even have seen, showing us that life continues that we are part of something larger than ourselves, and that is a gift of immense value to know that we are part of something moving forward, that we are a crucial and precious part of your design and plan for this world. Help us to feel your presence, not just this morning, but every day. We ask it in in the name of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, I'd like to invite you, if you're able to stand, as we sing together hymn 251, Christ has risen, alleluia.
Be seated. And as we prepare to go out into the world, as we prepare to offer our gifts in return for God's gift of abundant life, guaranteed at Easter, I ask you to join your hearts with mine in prayer. Please pray with me. God of resurrection, God of new beginnings, we stand before the empty tomb full of amazement and fear, like the scriptures describe the women who first discovered this Easter miracle. We are amazed, not sure how to go forward. Holy God, by your power, by your love, by the grace you extend to us and our world, even when we are undeserving, we ask for an awareness of your presence and guiding hand in our lives. If we can't hear you exactly clearly or we can't come up with the right words, we ask that you once again be patient with us and open our eyes and our hearts to all the signs around us of your presence in relationships and the beauty of this world this beautiful morning, and we come before you in prayer today, lifting our petitions for not only ourselves, but for those who suffer and struggle, who are searching for strength, who are restless, and even in the midst of crowds, feeling lonely. And we pray for guidance and hope so that we might not only live abundant lives, but somehow in small and sometimes larger ways share that gift of hope with others. Our fear is real. It is debilitating at times, oh God. We fear for ourselves, for our loved ones, for our world. It does seem so often that evil has gained traction, convincing many that violence and war or nastiness and condemnation, death and destruction are acceptable means to human ends. Forgive us, God. Turn our hearts toward what is holy and right. Turn our faces toward your risen Son, whose light graces us with peace and love and the wisdom that is found deep within human experience. On this Easter morning, Help us to recommit ourselves to that path of peace and open-hearted discipleship. Help us to be students of life, this gift that you have given to us, this precious gift. Savior, hear our prayers this morning for all those who are struggling to know hope, to trust that it is still uh, in existence for them. So we pray for those who are struggling under the weight of despair, we pray this Easter Sunday for those who are feeling trapped and victimized. We pray for those who lack necessary resources for survival. We pray for those who are exhausted and overwhelmed. We pray for those who are traumatized and depressed. We pray for those who are unsafe or caught in violence and war or without a place or a people to call home. We pray for the sick and the grieving and those who are struggling. And we ask now, O oh God, that you would hear us in silence as we, each one of us this morning, name those for whom we covet special prayers today. Strong and living God, we give you thanks and praise you as the one who rolls stones away and the one who opens minds and softens hearts. We stand in awe of your power on this Easter Sunday and your love. We celebrate your risen sun. As the flowers bloom this spring and the butterflies emerge from their cocoons, we can't help but hope in your everlasting, inexhaustible love our strong foundation that grounds us even as the world around us shakes. 
All these prayers we offer in the name of your risen Son, even Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, I'm, I'd like to now invite the ushers forward and Ray Vaughn as well as we take part in our morning offering.
Amen. Our closing hymn is 248, Christ is Risen, Shout Hosanna. Go into this day in peace and in joy, and as you go, may the grace of our resurrected Savior Jesus Christ, the deep and abiding love which can only come from God, and the life-giving and life-changing power of the Spirit be yours.